Hello, brilliant entrepreneur. It's Tash Corbin here and welcome to another episode of the Heart Centered Business Podcast. This is episode number 338, which means you can find all the relevant links and show notes for today's episode over at tashcorbin.com forward slash 338. In today's episode, I'm taking you on a behind the scenes journey and look at my experience with retreats. So whether you've been thinking about going on a retreat or potentially running one and selling one, this is going to be a really helpful episode for you. So let's dive on in. I'm Tash Corbin, and this is the Heart Centered Business Podcast. I'm going to start this episode by talking about my experience going on retreats personally, um, because I think that that gives a lot of insight into where my journey with selling retreats comes from and why I find retreats so valuable. So I go on retreats very regularly, whether that be for business or health and whether that be in a group or on my own. So um, my first ever retreat that I went on was for my business. And that was about a year and a half into starting my business when David and I decided that we wanted wanted to take the business mobile. We wanted to uh, work from other countries and find ourselves a little semi-permanent space overseas. And so we saw a retreat that was being held in Bali and it was a 10 day retreat to learn how to grow your business in a mobile way and practice uh, running your business whilst in different spaces in Bali. It was such a great experience. Initially, David and I weren't considering Bali as a space that we wanted to go to, to um, run the business. We were initially mostly focused on going to Europe and uh, going to some other countries, but we fell in love with the lifestyle in Bali and we really felt like we could get there and get ourselves set up quickly. And so that was actually behind our decision to move to Bali. So that retreat was really helpful for me to not only see what retreat facilitation would look like, but also to uh, experience life as a mobile entrepreneur and build my confidence in uh, being able to do that myself. So once I was in Bali, I was very inspired to facilitate my own retreats and I did them as solo retreats. So whilst we were living in Bali, we had a spare bedroom in our villa. So we invited people to come on retreat one at a time to stay with us and have three to four days of working on their business each day. And then we'd also show them the sites around Bali and take them to our favorite spaces. And then uh, when I was facilitating a mastermind in 2015, that mastermind also included a Bali retreat. And so that was the first group that retreat that I ran in Bali. Um, and we had five people come and be part of that retreat. So that was my early um, foray into retreats was actually going on one myself. And these days I go on multiple retreats per year. I try to go on at least two retreats every year for my health and well-being. So that's an opportunity for me to unplug, really focus on um, my health and healthy movement. And uh, I usually do my retreat at Bev Roberts um, house. She facilitates amazing VIP one-to-one -one health and wellbeing retreats. And I absolutely love and adore those. I'll make sure I put a little link to Bev's social media so you can um, check her out. But she runs brilliant one-to-one -one retreats in her home. She has a little um, flat that's attached to her home and that has an infrared sauna in it. Bev makes the most amazing food and it's so nourishing. And I call her Mama Bev because she really looks after me and it's such a beautiful experience. And so I aim to do that at least twice a year. If not that, then I'll do one with Bev and, and a different one. So I try and do at least two retreats every year just for my health and well-being. It's a little bit of a disconnect and a detox. And then I also do multiple retreats each year for my business. So some of those I just organize for myself and are solo retreats. I aim to do a solo retreat every two to three months. That's when I generally record most of my podcast episodes. I do a lot 
lot of the behind the scenes work in my business. I also do a lot of recording for my courses, programs, my um, accelerator mastermind, my new freebies. I generally create and record those on a solo retreat. That is because I have an epic space that is set up just for recording. I hire a place, I'm there on my own, and I really find it helps me with that change up of energy and location. It really helps me to uh, get focused in that creative space and just be very uh, focused on exactly what it is that I need to achieve. I've recently just come back from a solo retreat. I'm just doing a lot of the debriefs of that at the moment. So whilst I'm on retreat, I have this little post-it note system that I put up on the wall and I have um, a record of everything that I wanted to do on the retreat and everything that I have completed on that retreat. And so it's really helpful for me to get a big bunch of work done in a compressed amount of time. Um, and it's just such a really nourishing space and opportunity for me. I generally have my food pre-prepared, half my food pre-prepared by Davey, and then the other half I'm dining out and just having some really beautiful time being on my own. Um, even as a raging extrovert, I do find that I have a lot of um, you know, in, intuitive insights and creative ideas come from that time alone um, and just being in that creative space with I have nothing else to focus on but looking after myself and looking after my business. So I have a lot of experience going on retreats. I've also gone on a lot of retreats that are facilitated retreats or self-organized retreats with um, business friends. So I have one group of business friends um, that I met on a paid retreat with Denise Duffield Thomas, and then um, we still go on retreat with each other uh, we aim to go once a year and that's a really beautiful opportunity for us to have like a peer led masterminding retreat. We catch up with each other. It's absolutely brilliant and um, I absolutely adore and love that one. I also have um, an affinity with going on Denise Duffield Thomas's Rose Farm retreat. I've been twice. I'm going a third time this year and uh, it's just such a powerful, expansive opportunity for me. It's very money mindset focused. There's also some great insights into behind the scenes with Denise's business. And I just find it such a powerful space to be in. You know, you are the average of five, the five people you spend the most time with. And so spending time on retreat with people who are investing in a really big mindset shift and um, you know, who are have the same level of ambition and drive as we do. Uh, but then also Denise is such a fabulous role model for a very chill, very um, uh, boundaried model of business. And so it's absolutely gorgeous because being on that retreat, I have found there's no glorification of hustle. There's no, oh, we just need to work harder. We just need to get hungrier. It's actually very much focused on finding what is your unique pathway to wealth? What is the easiest way for this to be done? And what are the mindset blocks that are the thing that is stopping you from choosing the easy option? And so it's a really powerful retreat experience. I love going on retreat with Denise. And again, I'll probably go every year from here because I just love and adore it. And also we go to the one that has the Oscars party and Davey loves the Oscars. And so we, Davey comes down to um, Newcastle with me and he has an amazing time as well checking out the Oscars. And uh, we have a little holiday attached to our, that retreat time as well. So as I said, I've got lots and lots of experience going on retreats. I also have plenty of experience running them. So I ran my first retreats in Bali, as I said, but then we moved back into the Sunshine Coast in Australia in 2017. And in that time, I also facilitated a bunch of retreats as well. I offered small group retreats in my home. We had a six bedroom home there. It was just Davey and I, we were waiting for Munchkin to arrive and we bought, we um, rented this giant home because it was one of the only ones at the time that was fully furnished and allowed pets. So we thought, well, that's the only one we've got to choose. It was a beautiful home. So we decided to rent it. And um, I facilitated um, three people on retreat uh, consistently. And that 
covered our expenses uh, in that home and also you had quite a good profit margin on it as well. And so I facilitated five of those three on one retreats in our home. And I also facilitated one to one VIP retreats there from time to time as well. Uh, I also facilitated a retreat in New Zealand um, and I have re uh, facilitated um, the Finish Fest retreat, which is a joint venture retreat with Claire Riley here in Noosa uh, as well. I'm pointing to Noosa here on the video, but of course you have no idea where I am, but it's that way from me. Um, so running those retreats in Noosa was really, it, that retreat in Noosa was really great for me because I also got to experience another person's style and model of facilitating retreats. So I've run retreats in my own home, retreats at uh, venues and I've also done co-hosted or joint venture retreats as well. Now a couple of quick tips on that. From here I don't think I would ever facilitate a retreat in my home again. One of the challenges with facilitating retreats in my home was that there was no disconnection time and whilst I say I am absolutely a 29 out of 30 extrovert, when you're holding space for people in retreat uh, mode I think it's really important that you have good boundary time to just digest and process and um, just have that little bit of time to yourself. And so what I found was the more of those retreats I facilitated at my home, the more I would at 6 p.m. be like, OK, I'm going to go to my bedroom now and just you know, to have some of that extra time away. Whereas if I was facilitating at a um, venue, then it would be far easier to have that boundary time and that solo time without feeling like I need to host 24 seven. And so, yeah, that's definitely a boundary that I'm going to continue to um, stick with moving forward um, because I find, yeah, that just that, like there's no space, not to, I, that I wanna escape from people, but there is no space to escape to, in inverted commas, to just have that like processing time decompress and not be space holding for everyone all day and all night. So uh, yeah, that's just a little lesson of mine and a boundary that I've set. I know people who still do facilitate retreats in their home and it's totally fine for them. They don't necessarily get into caught into that space um, and that's totally fine as well. So it's just, I feel like from here, it's not gonna be a fit for me. Now, the big thing that I wanna talk about in this episode is selling retreats because actually selling retreats can get very tricky at times and it can be far more challenging than we assume it's going to be and we can sometimes get caught up in that belief of if I just offer it then it's going to be a no-brainer yes for people or um, if I just um, you know, put together the perfect agenda and have the most amazing massage thrown in that it's people are going to be able to automatically see the value. And absolutely that's something that I'm guilty of is because I get it when it comes to retreats and I know how valuable they are and I know like the intangibles of retreats, I sometimes can fall into the trap of when I'm marketing it, just assuming everyone else gets it as well. And so I talk, rather than talking about the tangible and more practical sides of being on retreat and what people are going to achieve from it, I just talk about the magic of retreats and I assume people are gonna get it. But that's not necessarily strong messaging and value proposition, so it's definitely something I need to continue refining for myself and continue to learn how to articulate the value proposition of a retreat in a way that doesn't have people thinking they're going to have workshops and strategy sessions and access to me 24 seven and all of those sorts of things um, that can also come from going the other way. You feel like you want people to get so much tangible goodness out of coming on retreat with you that you over schedule the time and you create this wildly rigorous agenda that it does feel like it's reassuring and comforting to you because you're keeping them busy the whole time and therefore you're giving them the most value. But as a retreat facilitator, I know that most of the value comes from the downtimes. Most of the value comes from being away from home 
and being in a different environment and having different conversations. And those conversations don't have space to happen if you micro schedule every minute of every day. So one of the things that I do when it is, comes to selling retreats is I create a very spacious agenda and I'm very clear on exactly what the focal point of that retreat is. Yes, people can come on retreat with me and we could work on any part of their business, but it's the same as me saying, oh, come and work with me as a mentor and we can work on anything. If you try to sell to everyone, you end up resonating with and speaking to no one. If you try to say your retreat does everything, people start to feel like they're going to get nothing done. And so having a strong focal point in the marketing and messaging of each retreat I have found has significantly improved the conversion and the rate at which we make sales of those retreats. Now, one of the other things that I wanted to um, talk about was that there aren't necessarily great lead magnets for retreats. So that's a question that I get asked quite a lot. Should I run a webinar and then upsell people into retreats like I would a course? Or do I run a challenge or do I have to run an in-person workshop because only locals are going to come on retreat with me? And the answer that I give is that there is no one proven lead magnet for retreat. And in particular, different retreats have um, different audiences that you want to attract. And retreats are probably the one product in my business that people go from zero to buying much faster than anything else. So for me, rather than trying to create lead magnets for my retreats, I instead focus on building that connection and engagement with my audience, seeding the talk about retreats quite consistently, and simply having a wait list for retreats. So for me, rather than um, using some form of opt-in or lead magnet to encourage leads to come to something that might then upsell to a retreat because there's a big difference between a one hour webinar and coming away on a five day retreat. That's like such a big leap. So rather than being focused on one specific lead magnet or one specific opt-in that's going to attract leads for a retreat, which I find is a bit um, disconnected. Instead, I talk about retreats quite consistently. I'm doing it now on this um, podcast, but I also do so whenever I'm on solo retreat, I'll do some Facebook Lives and some Instagram stories about that retreat, which generally gets a couple of inquiries in and I put, pop those people on the wait list. Uh, I talk about retreats in certain uh, podcast episodes. I've got one um, that's on how I structure a solo retreat to get work done. So I'll make sure I link to that in the show notes at tashcorbin.com forward slash 338. And then I also have promo posts for my retreats uh, go out quite consistently on my social channels and out to my mailing list. Uh, and that will generate a couple of inquiries. And then again, um, if that retreat is the right fit, we'll talk about that. But if not, they'll pop, pop them on the wait list for future retreats that might be a better fit for them. And so it's actually something that I just consistently seed and consistently um, generate leads for. And then when I feel like, okay, I've got some spaciousness here, I'm gonna do a retreat here and I wanna promote that, I promote it to my wait list first and then um, I will start promoting it more to my general audience and seeing if there's anyone who might be interested. So that is a behind the scenes look at my experience with retreats. And I would love for you to come and check out my new section of my website that is my new events tab. So I've just added this to my website. I thought this was a great opportunity for you to come and check it out. Over on the events tab, you'll find what my next retreats are that are up for offer. You'll also find any other events that I'm gonna be running. And that will include things like free workshops, in-person events, where I'm guest speaking somewhere, conference and of course these retreats that I'll be facilitating. There's also a link there for you to jump on the waitlist for future live events so that you don't miss out on those notifications. So it's a new feature of my website. I'd love for you to come and check it out. I'll make sure that the link is at tashcorbin.com forward slash 338. Thanks so much for joining me for this episode of the Heart Center Business Podcast. Until next time, I cannot wait to see you shine. Bye for now. 
Would you like more tips, tools, and resources to help you grow your heart-centered business? Head to tashcorbin.com today.